great mystery for this breath of life. Water is sacred. It's a part of us and it connects us to the earth, our mother. Water is what sustains us and one of the greatest sacrifices we can make is to go without water when we fast for our vision. These visions bring great knowledge to our people. We all need water to survive. We all depend on it and are pitiful without it. It is a gift. When mothers are pregnant, they carry the baby and water in their bellies. And when that water breaks, the baby is born and new life on earth begins. Water is our first teacher, medicine. When we release tears, those water droplets from our eyes nourishing new life somewhere, and new life also begins for us. Water also helps nourish the spirit within us and the cycle of life to continue. Water is sacred. Water is life. Quay, my name is Kelly Vaden, and I'm a co-moderator today of the session along with Dr. Emily Doyle, who will introduce herself shortly. I would like to welcome everyone to this session, Philanthropy, Food Systems and Climate Change, hosted by the Atlantic Hub of the Phylab Network. Thank you to Anik Boivin for connecting us with the video we began with to help ground this discussion surrounding fish as food in connection with Shannon Paul's description of water as life, water as sacred, and water is critical to fish and food systems. We are very grateful to Anik for this and for her insight in helping us develop the panel. The Atlantic Hub of PhiLab is based at Grenfell Campus Memorial in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, Labrador. As such, I'd like to begin by acknowledging with deep appreciation the lands that on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of our province. But I come today to you from the west coast of Canada in Victoria, and as such would also like to acknowledge with respect the Legungan people, the Songhees, and Esquimalt nations, on whose homeland the city stands and whose historical relationships with the land continue today. The Atlantic Hub includes academic and partner members and organizations from the provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia and PEI, and we are working to expand our network. So if anyone on the line is from or working in Atlantic Canada on philanthropy issues, we'd love to hear from and connect with you. The Canadian Philanthropy Research Network operates across Canada to mobilize and support actors in the philanthropic sector through research, networking and capacity building. At the Atlantic Hub, we have focused on better understanding the philanthropic landscape in Atlantic Canada and on rural communities, food systems, and environmental sustainability issues. We have begun to look at some of the difficult but critical questions raised at yesterday's wonderful panel about the relationships between philanthropy and settler, settler colonialism in Atlantic Canada. And Sarah Lavely, who's on the line with us today as a note taker, uh, she will record notes from today's sessions and we'll compile them into a blog article to help with the conversation. Sarah worked with the Rural Communities Foundation of Nova Scotia recently uh, to look at the impacts of philanthropic giving in rural Nova Scotia in conjunction with the foundation. And Emily will introduce herself shortly and her work on philanthropy and food systems, just to give you a sense of what we're doing at the Atlantic Hub. Also, I'd like to introduce Jean-Marc Fontan and thank uh, him and Peter Elson as well for helping us with the discussion that will follow the presentations. And Jean-Marc will help with the French language component of the discussion as well. Emily, I'd like to turn it over to you now to introduce yourself and the, the origin of the panel today. Thank you to PhiLab and to Dr. Vaden to allow me to speak here today. I recently joined the PhiLab Atlantic Hub working as a postdoc with Dr. Vaden and helping to coordinate the Atlantic Hub. The idea for today's panel session came out of my PhD research focused on the school food system in Newfoundland and Labrador. I met Kimberly Orne, one of today's panelists, through this research and discovered through her and others a disconnect between fish as food, as a cultural connector and environmental connector, 
and the types of food and learning ingested by children at school. I also began a process of discovering my ignorance of Indigenous foodways in my homeland, beginning a further process of attempting to build connections with and support understanding of food systems actions with the process of reconciliation. I believe that the ongoing process of improving food systems that work for people for the planet is deeply connected to restoring respect, relationships, and reciprocity through Indigenous resurgence. I have learned more about these ideas through reading a recent Canadian publication from Seti and Shukla called Indigenous Food Systems. Interestingly, much food system work across the country is supported through philanthropy and the way in which even philanthropic organizations recognize that project successes are dependent on policy changes is for me a sign in which a deep understanding of food as interconnected to humans and to the planet is a tangible way to push policy. Today, we're lucky to have a diverse panel to speak to their personal connection to the subject of investing in the connections between fish as food, as connection to the environment, and to understand how these conversations cross cut with indigenous food sovereignty. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time this particular group of individuals has been brought together to speak on this subject, and we are so grateful that everyone is able to be here today. Uh, next, Kelly and I will briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, we're not going to read through their full bios as these are available to you through the conference website, and we would rather use this time to hear from these individuals. So we're asking that each of the panelists will speak for 15 minutes and after the panelists have shared their insight, we would like to facilitate a discussion between the panelists and the audience. We ask that people joining on use the chat to suggest any topics or questions for discussion and we also encourage panelists to ask each other about particular issues and insights that can further all of our understanding of the future role of philanthropy and research in reinvigorating humanity's connection to the land and earth through food and in particular fish as food. I'll hand it over to you, Kevin, for those introductions. <clears throat> okay, so, so we'll do the panel introductions now, Emily, is that? Sorry, okay. I think uh, I'll start. So, yeah. Okay, uh, first I'd like to welcome you Marlene Hale. Um, Marlene is a member of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Anik Boivin uh, connected us with you Marlene um, and we are happy to have you as part of this panel today. We're very grateful for Anik in her insight in helping us to develop this panel. Marlene is a chef and is engaged in protecting the environment in the anti-pipeline struggle. Okay. And we also have with us here today, uh, Kathy Loon. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy is uh, with the Sioux, Look Sioux Lookout Menno Yawin Health Center, as now as executive lead for Indigenous Collaboration and Relations and formerly Traditional Programs Manager. We'll hear more from Kathy shortly, but I'll, I will just say that she has almost 30 years of experience working for First Nations and Indigenous organizations in areas of economic, business and corporate development which uh, has included a range uh, of different initiatives related to traditional medicines, foods, governance, and leadership. And <clears throat> Dr. Lauren, thank you for being here today as an associate professor and ARL chair at the University of Guelph. He's worked on issues at the intersection of sustainability, food systems, and social justice, primarily in coastal settings. His research has taken him to such diverse places as Arctic Alaska, the Gulf Islands of British Columbia, Columbia, the prairies of Saskatchewan, Maine, Ireland, and Mexico. And I think today you're coming from California. Is that right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. Thanks, Phil. And finally, we have Kimberly Oren, who's a former high school science teacher turned commercial fisherman and co-founder of Fishing for Success, a community-based nonprofit social enterprise that works to transmit the intangible cultural heritage of Newfoundland and Labrador's family fishery, advocating for an inclusive, gender equitable, and sustainable small-scale fishery. Thank you. Hello.
So Marlene, I, are you comfortable starting off the discussion here? Absolutely. Thank you very much. And good afternoon. Bonjour, comment ça va? And happy uh, so in Zim. My name is Marlene Hale, and I am from the Wet'suwet'en Nation, which is in northern British Columbia. And I was born in a small town called Smithers, BC. And as growing up, I've lived in Vancouver all my life, and I've been teaching cooking, culture, and cuisine all across the land uh, for the last 25 years. And I think we've taught almost about 20, I know about 10,000 kids all across Canada. Now I've turned activist for my people of the Wet'suwet'en, as you know, is where the pipeline is going, is fighting its way through our 22,000 square kilometers of territory of the Wet'suwet'en nation. And that's sort of just where I will just start with in the talks of today um, on food, myself as a chef uh, from the Wet'suwet'en Nation. And it's all about my teaching, what I can deliver. And it is changing um, drastically as, uh, you know, you always have to keep yourself updated on the food source of each territory, each nation for the indigenous people all across the land. In the last six months, uh, traveling from Vancouver Island uh, on another story called Ferry Creek, I know that the, uh, I, I have a webinar that I hold every week and a lot of it has been mostly on food sustainability. Um, it's about sustainability of gardening because we have to go back to the old ways. And it's something my mom, my grandmother and my families have been pushing on, on us for, for the length of time, but it is now. And I've been having some um, serious discussions and just one item alone called eggs. So we started it off with, what are you paying in Victoria for a dozen eggs versus Atlantic? And what are you paying for it up in the Inuk uh, regions and for in the middle of Canada, plus down in the States? And the, it, it went from $4 to nine to the can't, can't get it. Can't, there's no source for it anymore. So that leads me into my nation where we are the salmon people. And from the salmon, I remember like 10, nine years ago where we had like 3 million salmon, it was very abundant. And going to now to where my hometown of Smithers to our, our our people of the Whitsett Nation is dwindled right down to two salmon per household. That's a very big scary deal with food and fish. We next looked at as myself as I, I, I'm a chef by trade so I deal a lot with uh, our traditional foods. I'm always having to uh, reinvent myself because of the food chain and what it exactly what it is. No more wild game in certain regions. Uh, I've been catering for the last 20 years and now I'm no longer catering because of COVID. But not only that, because buffalo, uh, wild sockeye salmon, salmon, and many of the indigenous ingredients are not on my list anymore because I simply cannot uh, get them because of COVID. Buffalo, for one, most of the farms have been shut down. They are now just reopening. The food, the fish, uh, the fish for me to get from the fishmongers all across. So if I was going to get cod in Victoria, um, it was not a problem. If I got, got salmon, it would have been a big problem. Uh, it seems Alaska has got most of the, the good sockeye salmon now. Versus if I'm coming to Montreal here, I'm doing catering. I use the Atlantic salmon. And so it is, uh, it's a whole hearty, um, item that's on everyone's menu in their minds and it's, on, it's all in our cultural uh, menu. You know, we are all, it starts stemmed from the very beginning of when we're talking about the water. And the water right now in the Wet'suwet Nation is becoming uh, a huge big problem because of the pipelines where it's leading worse and worse and bigger problems in our food source. The fish alone has taken a big uh, toll um, as traditionals, we do a lot of medicines and I, our, my tea, for instance, in, in our region, we call it Ladi Mesquique. And it's something I drink, it's in my coffee, my cup every day. 
But the mesquite is, you know, starts from five different uh, wild teas that we get. And in BC, where my family live, it's really a hard source sometimes to get because of the wildfires and the flooding everywhere. It's just destroying many uh, regions where all summer long, right from spring all the way to the end of October, we're still harvesting our wild teas and our, our medicines. And late in Northern British Columbia, we're harvesting our fish finally in July. And so from the fisheries department, it's always the news who are just my own cousins and my uncles to find exactly where we are doing um, one of the, uh, one, of, one of our, our biggest major uh, calls for action is to the government to do something about the sustainability and, and helping the people in the northern regions all across the map because of the food source, the water starting from the water. And we are we're having people that need help all across. If they don't get good clean water, they'd have a very hard problems with their food and growing it. And sometimes now with the sustainability of gardening, we are looking, do you actually have something to grow it in? If something has been flooded, it's full of toxins. It's impossible to start gardening. If something is full of toxins, you can't even walk through it or put your hand on it without having gloves because you don't know what you're handling. And if, if something is full of toxins, so starting from the water, the soil, the air, everything we build things with, and whether it's natural or not, we are putting one big disastrous thing into another and so it leads into our mental health and wellness and uh, what we what we eat is who we are so that begins with a, a very big you know uh newer problem of what you've been eating which is your traditional food is is literally killing you and making you sick so they asked me for for my answers i'm still on the research on this by talking, cooking, tasting, and uh, getting input. So I have uh, a recipe that I've, I've used 10 years ago, I can't use today because I have to reinvent certain uh, ingredients. And ingredients that are coming from a certain region, we have to tell, for example, in Northern Alberta, you cannot do, use the, uh, the, the wild game, the moose, for instance, because of the tar sands, the, the, mo the moose is green, the meat is green. It's uh, inedible. And so somebody is asking me in Northern Quebec here where I am, they have fish and they were, they were cutting it one day and I said, this fish has got lice. And they said, how do you know that? I said, I've seen sea lice on salmon. I've seen all the things that are growing on, on fish on the west coast of Vancouver Island where it was the most abundant, the best ever, which is now we, we, we just did a, uh, on my webinar not too long ago, a thing on with an oceanography of, about the waters around Vancouver Island, which in, infects the fish and what is actually people are eating. So to understand uh, what I'm talking about, I, I talked to the experts, the scientists, the bot botanists, and people who are experts in all our trees, everything else that we're having. So where our, our food source is coming from, I speak and I ask and I have them on my webinar to what the problem is in each region all across the land. So in my teaching, I teach more online now. I have my chef jacket on today. I first uh, saw some Indian students in Nook for the first time live. So it was really nice to have uh, conversations and seeing an actual person two feet from me versus uh, on screen. And they had many questions for me. And the question that they had was, can I, I can't make that. I'd love that recipe you gave me because I can afford only one item. And how else can I make it? So I have to have answers for these, these students. And so this is where I say I'm always reinventing. Say, I used to be able to say, if you only had $25, this is what you can get. And I would make a recipe, a menu uh, from that. Nowadays, it's I only have $5. How can I feed myself? 
what do I say? It's a very hard question, but it's the truth. These are students and that's basically how they, they their survival is key to me and key to the understanding of what I teach. And uh, I look at what they have. And so basically I say, I can go in your fridge and I can, I tell you, I can make something for sure. That's what chefs do. And you, you can make it look, you know, pretty and, and uh, edible. And, and uh, so the $5 question is a pretty hard question when you're given that. And it's, it is the, our way of life. So as we give thanks to the creator and many other issues of things we have around food, we really do need the guidance of our elders and the people before them to knowing what more can you sustain from the forest that you don't have and didn't have before that are still out good and out there for you. And choosing, uh, really getting them to give them a basket, walk with me in the forest and let's forage something together. And this is what we do a lot of. Foraging is very important because it's, it's part of what you call forest bathing. Forest bathing is somewhere where you just go out for three days, you sustain in the forest, you live with the forest, and you respect the forest. After three days, you come back and they ask you questions. What did you eat? What did you do? How did you survive out there? Would you ever do this again? And we say yes because it's reinventing our, our lives and our situations around what we have now and what we don't have. And we need to look at it as in a future basis. The children today I see are the eighth generation and they're the most important because it's their survival, their future, their, their future generation to take toll of, of what they, they have. And I, I explained to them how apologetic I am because I am part of the biggest problem there is out there, what it is today. But I'm also part of the solution of trying to help out and do my part and gaining, giving them the education and the tools they need to start off with, even if it's just $5. I'm not sure where my 15 minutes, so I know you'll tell me to, um, uh, so given all of this, like. From my mother is many of the, the films, the movies, the videos and uh, documentaries I have done. It just starts with simplicity. It starts with Bannock. And I have one little video called My Life with Bannock, how my life with Bannock has, has taken me all over the country. And I have my drum and I drum my way all the way from one province to the other, teaching Bannock and talking about food and let me know what you have in your fridge. And when, you're, when you show me something, I teach you how and to, to, to go further, the furthest that you can with, with whatever size family that you have. And going across this land, I do it with all of knowing the respectful traditions of each, what each of you have around food and, and how to respect and show me what you have and we together we learn how to forage we learn how to what you what fish you eat a lot of people aren't fish eaters uh, a lot of them are wild game and uh, so even bannock um, making for me is getting more costly as the more northern i go and the more northern i go i, I mentioned to the inner students today the first thing you do for your grandmother when you go home when you leave the, your university you put flour in your suitcase, you put baking powder and you put yeast, things that are very important that you don't have at home and that are so expensive for them up there. To make bannock, make sure at least you can have one or two items that makes the whole day uh, 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 easier for them. And the second thing that you do is find out sources of how you can fly things home when people are always going people are always going back and forth and find out who's going and send things with them because i noticed in two communities in northern uh, uh where is it northern uh, ontario that they are sending little items medical and stuff like that through um through the air so they're they're able to 
do it with, with seeds. And so one community was, I bring seeds from Quebec here, I, I bring them uh, out west and see how they can grow it. Because as a chef, I am um, in with a lot of seeds, the Mohawk seeds, the, the corn, beans, and the squash, which holds their territory together. So I get, I bring uh, corn seeds to the west and I teach them that this corn is grown in a different uh, uh, window than yours. So we've only got a four hour window to grow things in uh, Quebec. Four months of the season is very short. So corn and we, they grew uh, last year, unbelievably watermelon here, a very small variety. And because the, the four hour, uh, four month rather uh, window was able to do it, they, they, it was successful. They had four blends and only two were, were, were very good. And we did the same thing with corn uh, to see how they are growing in different regions versus just uh, what they have in Quebec. And those seeds were brought up from Dakota and seeing in another area exactly where they were uh, growing. Also, they, they showed, um, so they would give me the squash, the corn and the uh, watermelon. And we had a tasting to see how they would store versus the same thing as they do in uh, Costco and how they would store at home and how many months that, that you could you could have them in storage, which is really important. And so they also, the tasting was something if you had bought in the store versus what they just grew, it's two different things that just um, amazingly, um, you know, the, the traditions that we have around corn, bean and squash is very important because we all share traditions all across the land. And here where I am in Quebec, I really learned what the locals are doing and doing it their way. The Mohawk, Anishinaabe, all the different 11 nations of Quebec, of their foods, their food value. And I, as I travel, it's the first thing I look at is to see what's on their plate and how did they get it and how much do, can they have of it. With moose moratoriums going all across Canada, the wild game is getting more and more nil. So if you have a big moose in your freezer, you should be ashamed because we're trying to keep down the stocks. And I'm that kind of a person that I'm, you talk about the chef, but I'll be the activist and I will call you out. You shouldn't be having this. It's supposed to be leaving them alone. You shouldn't be proud of saying you're a great hunter. A great hunter would hold it for a couple of years so that it would multiply it for your children and your children's children. So think about it that way, not just about uh, putting, taking a big prize of yours at home. And calling the, the also going to the different MLAs, the, the, the governments are very good at that. I will call you out. I will write letters and, you know, for, for the, we are doing the biggest uh, thing on, on water right now. And without that many regions, how can they grow anything? They can't even drink the water. How can they put that in the garden? And so with, with the, uh, the floods of BC last year, I worked with so many different communities and this is where I was given a glass of water and it was brown. And so if it was brown, how can I water the garden with that and feel good about it? And so if it, it was brown from the tap water, and so it had so many toxins in it, they couldn't identify which was which. And so this was the question that we had as far as, far as activists was concerned. And, you know, as ph ph philanthropy that to really, really look at um, the, the one thing that we all put in our mouth, no matter we, we first thing in the morning to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, what are you gonna make it with? And if you're in a region and you don't have drinking water, how can I say have a good cup of coffee, a, st a good start of the day, there's no such thing. And I have been there when they didn't have anything. So if we didn't bring anything of our own, we also brought the tablets to put in the water to, to clean it. And when we were doing that, the coffee, I was just very cautious of dr drinking it because of just where it started from. And with cancer rising uh, rapidly through so many Northern uh, communities of BC that I know, because they're my people, they're my nation and uh, the Wet'suwet'en and beyond, cancer is rising just so horribly. 
And the, the hardest thing to, to understand there is that the medical system is coming to a complete crash. So there's nothing, it's like a domino effect. The minute you fix one thing, another thing comes on it and messes that up. So you've got another problem on top of that. And it just goes on and on until you figure out one solution after another. And so you're always facing more and more atrocities against human nature. It's, it's against environmental uh, racism. It's, it goes all and it falls right into what's on your plate at the end of the day. And so when you look at that plate and what I'm teaching somebody, three articles you put on there. Majority of the children today are not eating meat because they're afraid of what they're eating. So there's more and more vegans and vegetarians. So it's tough on me because I said, my grandmother, my grandfather was never vegan or vegetarian. So I'm trying to identify myself uh, and you're the food source, making recipes around something that is so hard because we were never vegans. We're always eating wild game. Uh, and so when, if you're saying, what can I make uh, indigenous that is vegan and vegetarian, it's pretty hard for me to come with, with that, a food source given from the Canada Food Guide and also the indigenous food guide. So it's like reinventing absolutely everything around you. So like I say, it goes in a domino effect. And so you have to always think ahead of what questions they ask. I said, okay, I gotta figure out a way to do this. And as you know, kids have always got questions. And the more questions that they have, the more work I have to do all around food, sustainability, traditions, and what it was in the past is not in the future. And we have to forget about the past and look into what, how we can fix the future and make it a, a sensible uh, plate that they can understand and they can teach their children. Basically, by the time they get to their age, they told me, they said, we'll have to rewrite history just on food. I said, maybe you're right. And, and it's very hard because kids come up with really good questions today. Today, I had very good questions. And the questions was all around the food. And most of it from the Inuit students was how much I can't afford. And how much, so the more northern they are, they said, we, we, don't, we can't make bannock up there. Flour is just so expensive. And all the other ingredients, I said, so... She said, I said, what else besides flour is so expensive? She said, toilet paper. I said, okay, that's the second thing you put in your suitcase, flour and toilet paper. Take the little other stuff that you have and, you know, to take it home up north so you can have this type of lifestyle that everybody else. It's very, very sad to listening to conversations around the $5 is basically what they can't afford. When one said he hasn't had, uh, he drinks, um, some things here because he can't get it at home. He, he, he knows he'll never see it again. One thing they don't see too much is eggs. Celery was $25 in one place. So we know the prices of, of food compared to what they are here. And so I had a bag of food that I had paid and itemized and made uh, at Native Montreal for the students. So for $30, I took everything out of the bag that I had and I showed them what we can make for $30. And it, it was amazing because um, they today were just shocked that they're, they're middle class, they're, they, they both are working, and yet when it comes to food, it's the hardest part of the day. So they are introduced now to the food bank system even though they are both working because that is just what it is. And so therefore that $30 that I have, I get them to mix what they can afford to pay for in cash, the rest try to get it out of the food bank, what you can. And finding um, food, the free food, that is, a, that is one thing is my specialty for everybody in, in Montreal. It's one thing I'm really good as a chef of knowing where you can get free food and how it's dispersed, where it's dispersed, and where to get it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marlene. I'm you. sorry to interrupt you um, while you're, while you're
talking to us. I do want to just move to the next panelist so we can hear from um, other people and hopefully return to these conversations as a group after the other speakers. So Kathy, I invite you to start. I'm going to share my screen because I have your presentation here. And you just let me know um, when to switch the slides. I'm not seeing anything. No. Oh, there. There it is. There it is. Okay. I hope I can do this. <laughs> but it's a small little screen at the corner of my computer here. Um, Pojo, uh, my name is Kathy Loon. I'm uh, I'm I'm in the traditional territory of Laksu, the Ojibwe's of Laksu in northwestern Ontario. I was asked to speak about our Meacham program, um, but I can't. And I usually try to um, move people away from um, just isolating um, our our Meacham program, our our foods program, and uh, and talk about uh, our traditional programs because one doesn't work in isolation. One program doesn't work in isolation from each other. They're all connected. So the traditional program. Um, can you move to the next page? The traditional programs uh, at Minoyao, and there's um, six of them in total. Um, just a little bit of a background. Our um, our hospital, um, we serve an area that's about the size of Germany in northwestern Ontario. Um, we have um, five um, urban communities in our area, as well as 28 First Nations. <clears throat> 25 out of the 28 First Nations are fly-in only. We are a 60-bed facility with uh, 20 long-term care beds. Um, into, we moved into this building in 2010, but negotiations uh, for a four-party agreement started in 1997. Um, prior to this, there were two hospitals in Sulacote. One was provincially funded where um, non-native people went and the other one was federally funded. It used to be a, a TB sanatorium or the Sul it was called the Sulacote Indian Hospital. Um, it served um, First Nations people. So we had a segregated healthcare system prior. And in the late 80s, uh, we wanted to change that and build a, a whole brand new facility where everyone worked together and everybody was um, um, in partnership. Next page, please. So um, brief history, um, the traditional programs is a result of a four party negotiations that was signed in 1997. Um, we had a 25 year mandate to develop an, an an agreement on combining hospital and hospital-related services to improve health and healthcare services, to better balance healthcare services between prevention and treatment of illness, and to strengthen relationships amongst all parties. Um, just a little background to that. Our we are traditionally hunters and gatherers, um, and that's that's our physical self. Um, we have changed our life our culture, our lifestyle within uh, 50 to 100 years, which is only one or two generations. Um, and there was a lot of health consequences. Um, we have an extremely high diabetes rate um, in this area. Uh, but the funding uh, for uh, to the healthcare system in this area remained at the 1960s. 1970s level. So in 1988, there were five protesters from Sandy Lake who protested to um, and you know to bring about change. Um, they wanted to improve on the services, uh, healthcare services to Northwestern Ontario. Next page, please. The first. Uh, the first program we have is our Dabitamagewen, and then our Wichiwewen, our Ndawewen, our Mashkiki, our Michim, and our Bimadizwe. Next page, please. Our Dabitamagewen 
program is our governance and leadership board um, leadership program. Uh, we have um, two thirds of our board are representatives from tribal councils or large First Nations. And then only five people are from the Southern communities, which is the five that I that I spoke about earlier. They're from Sulcote and Pickle Lake, the towns in this area. Also, we have a special advisor and a, and a traditional healer, traditional healers committee at, um, chairperson. Advising them is a council of eight elders uh, from various communities up north, and they have three-year terms, and they um, provide advisory services to the board on things that come to, to Anishinaabe people that are more global in nature. And they also bring back um, concerns or um, they take back information to the communities. Next page, please. Our Wichiwewin program um, is our interpreter program. We provide interpreter services uh, in Ojibwe, Oji Cree, and Cree languages, not only within the hospital, but as well now through partnerships that we have, we can um, provide interpreter service um, to any hospital in Ontario. Uh, we also have our elders in residence program. 20 of our acute care beds are um, used by um, chronic care patients or, or ALC patients uh, waiting for long-term care beds and uh, it's really important that these elders um, visit. So we have um, Emily Gregg, um, the second picture uh, from your left. Uh, she is Christian Oji Cree and works mainly in acute care. Next, we have Priscilla Kakekaspan. She's Cree, uh, also Christian, uh, and she works with palliative care. Dora Beardy, um, she is OG Cree, um, works uh, with the maternity, and we're very big on um, in encouraging young women to breastfeed. Uh, the majority, probably about 90% of the babies born in this hospital are First Nation. And uh, one of the really sad statistics is uh, over 90% of those 95%, you know, walk out of here and they don't breastfeed their babies, which is uh, very important. Then Ralph Johnson, he's our, uh, he provides our cultural programming. Um, next page, please. We have our Ndawewin program. We have a healing room. Uh, we have ceremonial items and off uh, the door that you see to your right here in the picture is a, there's a kitchenette in there where the healers from the Mushkiki program come in to make their medicines. They dry out their medicines, keep their medicines there, or the patients come in, mix medicines together, whatever the prescription is. Our Mushkiki program, um, we have a roster of traditional healers in the area that uh, come and see patients if the patients ask to, to see them. Um, in our hospital, a patient can have a com uh, Western medicine or traditional medicine or a combination of both. Um, we we want to look at the uh, spiritual, mental and physical and emotional uh, healing of people when they come to our facility. Next page, please. Because it was so hard to work together, the federal system and the provincial system, um, it was very hard for the two to work together. Um, there had to be some um, culturally safe care training, as well as a Nishinaabe cultural training program was, um, was started. And that was started in uh, 2008. Um, it's a two-day mandatory training for all SLMHC employees, and it's all offered to other organizations as well in, in Sulaco. Next page, please. Finally, our uh, medium uh, traditional foods program. We're the only hospital that can serve uninspected wild meats and games um, to in a hospital in Canada. Um, and it wasn't easy to do this. Um, 
we have to have a separate kitchen and uh, we have to be written excuse me uh, we needed special exemption uh, granted in the Health Protection and Promotions Act. Um, in order to do this, um, we can't serve just traditional meals. We, uh, we have a three-week menu cycle. First week, it's traditional foods. The second week, it's co contemporary foods. And the third week, it's farmed foods. Um, traditional meats uh, coming from the land, I consider that uh, happy food and it's good for us. It's culturally appropriate and it's good for our, uh, our systems. Food is medicine, food is culture, and food is identity. It's still very, it's still very important today. Next page, please. Um, Actually, can you skip over to the next uh, next page? Traditional foods is offered to patients um, twice a week uh, and is prepared in such a way that in, to ensure each meal fits with the majority of our nutritional diets. Um, what that means is we have a small kitchen. If you, you want to go to the next page? I think it's the next page. Yeah, here's our, is, here's a picture of our kitchen. We have a, a small kitchen that's separate from the cafeteria kitchen. Um, we can, if um, if 30 people or 30 patients want a traditional meal for the day, we have to cater to patients on special diets because we only have the one stove, so only one meal can be, one type of meal can be prepared. So, um, the day before or two days prior, we usually get people to sign uh, waiver forms. Um, to serve one meal a week, we need uh, per year on an annual basis, about four moose, 1,200 pounds of fish, 100 geese, 20 beaver. Most of what we eat when we say traditional foods is, um, or over 50% anyway, is fish. Um, partridge, rabbits, ducks, when we can gather them. Of course, that's easier said than done. We can't pay for uninspected wild meat. Uh, it's against the law. Um, we, have to, <clears throat> we have to have it donated. And Northwestern Ontario is probably one of the most economically depressed areas around. Um, really, um, bad food insecurity um, in this area. So we're not going to get uh, food donated from the northern communities. We had to get, uh, we had to be very creative with our, in how we did this. We developed partnerships. Initially too, um, when, um, when we developed recipes back in the early um, 90s when we started this program, you know how grandmothers or kokums make um, make their meals, in the, they don't use recipes, right? It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that until their ancestors tell them that that's enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, we had to fly in a lot of kokums from the north from northwestern Ontario and we had to get them to cook for us and a dietitian was with them as well as uh, the cooks and they came up with recipes and those recipes we standardized and we put the nutritional value in each of the recipes that we have okay uh next page please okay next page sorry So this is how we did it. First, uh, we had to get um, um, we had to change the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Um, it basically it's written right in there that we can serve uninspected wild meats and games in the hospital. Next page, please. Secondly, we had to, in the act that establishes Sulkot Minoyawan Well Health Center that went through Parliament for first, second, and third reading, um, we had to get that written right in there as well, um, that we can serve uninspected wild meat and game. Um, next page, please. 
in order to do that, you know, um, we have to have some kind of quality control. So this form, um, the hunter fills this form out, the butcher fills out the form, and the transportation company fills out this form. Pretty much the same way that uh, if you have roast, if you have roast beef, uh, if you're serving roast beef, pretty much how the same way that's tracked. Next page, please. The fourth process is we have to have a, a meet and patient waiver. Anybody that wants to have um, a meet and meal uh, the next day has to sign this waiver. And it's the interpreters that have to ask them. And everybody's allowed to have a meet and meal, whoever wants it. And here's a copy of one of our standardized recipes. Okay, so any any cook can go in there and make a meal for the patients because most of our our staff is um, is unionized okay uh, next page please so the partnerships I spoke about earlier we have to be very creative in our partnerships we've um, partnered with the Ministry of Natural Resources in this area or Thunder Bay and on north there's probably about six seven or eight most confiscated every year by hunters who have um, who don't have the right tags or who've shot the wrong moose or whatever the case may be and uh, we usually get the moose and they take it to the butcher and then we pick it up from the butchers or we've partnered with the Silicon and anglers and hunters association the local trappers association for nuisance beavers or the local commercial fisheries or the local walleye tournaments in the area um, the one tournament here in Silicon, we get about 50% uh, of the fish that we need throughout the year from just this one tournament and also the another tournament in Ear Falls um, we get probably the other 50% we just have to go and cut it um, we get our food donated by the local and regional citizens and the local and regional First Nations next page please so how does this all fit together in the in the medicine wheel model you know when you're serving a, a patient uh, medium foods um, emotionally medium provides a very comfortable environment feelings that your culture is being respected when you're served your own food um, and that improves mental health in this day and age when there's so much um, system, systemic racism. This is the one area, food is one area, you know, that tells people, you know, I respect you by serving them their own, their own food. And I'm a firm believer every culture in this world should be allowed their own food, their own cultural food. No one culture's food should, is a superfood. It's not. That's how people evolve, is through their own food. Uh, under the physical section, medium is nutritious. It is the most nutritious for Anishinaabe, more so than any other cultural group's foods. Under the mental, under, under the mental section, eating medium provides good mental health. It's, uh, it's happy food. To us, it hasn't been penned up hasn't been mistreated it's out there you know out on the land and when you eat it it's uh it's the most nutritious food it it it, it gives us a lot of good energy and under the spiritual section you know Nishnabe people we believe that we were at our strongest spiritually when we are out on the land our spirituality comes from the land so if you give a plate of moose meat to an elder that's in the hospital that's unable to go home or that is not feeling very well, you give him a plate of moose meat, you sit down, and you know he'll talk about the food. 
or the weather looking out the window. But it, if you sit there long enough, they'll start talking to you about their hunting days. You know, when they were at their most strongest spiritually. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so the truth and reconciliation, we... Um, all this, of course, predates the truth and reconciliation, the calls to action that came out in 215. And basically, um, we were very, very happy to see um, providing culturally safe and culturally appropriate care within, within the calls to action. At least this is how we interpret it. Specifically, call to action number 22, we call upon those who affect change within the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the value of Aboriginal healing practices. Food is medicine. All these programs are connected together. One does not work in isolation from each other. And it takes a whole hospital to do this, right from the interpreters, um, kitchen staff, all the way up to the chairperson of the board. Um, it takes a whole hospital to do this, and it's a lot of work. Uh, but we have made a commitment in this hospital to do just that, because we recognize how important it is. Next page, please. So here is our hospital. Um, and you can go around the medicine wheel. This is the medicine wheel model of care. You know, uh, starting with the yeast where the uh, babies are born, we have the OBS program, our acute care, emergency services. You can follow that all the way around, around the medicine wheel, north with the elders and residents program. And all these programs are interconnected and they work with each other. When the, it does not work in isolation. That's the medicine wheel model of care, especially for patients that have to fly from the northern communities um, and and stay here for a long time. Um, that's it for my presentation. We have uh, that's been our 25 year journey, uh, but there's a there's a long way to go. Uh, we're starting off on another 25 years. Uh, where we're working with the community. Personally, I'd like to see all these programs tied. I'd like to see a greenhouse or a garden outside where we can, you know, teach patients. Uh, because, you know, one patient, when they're here, uh, and if they have an appointment on, on a Monday, non-insured is not going to send them back, um, especially if they have another appointment on Thursday. So what are they going to do with all that dead time? You know, if you look at the young people, if you can have them, if you can have programming such as gardening programs, you may not help that person right away, but you can help that person in 15 years. Maybe they'll start a garden of their own in, uh, in their own community. That's how you improve. Uh, it's, it's all tied together, you know. Anyway, that's it for my presentation. We have a long way to go. It's a big commitment. But we do it at this hospital, and we're very proud to do so. I should have also mentioned that uh, probably about 90, 95% of our patients are Anishinaabe from the northern communities. So it's, uh, it's a big number. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Loring now, so I'll share my screen again. Oh, wrong one. No. Okay, I'll dive right in. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly, for and Emily for asking me to be here, um, and thank you for the two presentations that kicked us off. That really helps me um, think about where to take these slides. Uh, my name is Phil Loring. I'm the Errol Chair in Food Policy and Society at the University of Guelph. 
um, University of Guelph is on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas, but I'm speaking with you all today uh, from Northern, what is now known as Northern California, um, the traditional lands and territories of the Washu people. Um, and what I want to talk a little bit about today is some of the work that we've done over the last year and a half that really has given some insight into leverage points uh, for building capacity for philanthropy. Opportunities, I call it here, for social investment, uh, focusing specifically on uh, our fish's food work around the impacts of uh, COVID-19 and also some interesting social innovations um, that um, I've had the, the opportunity to um, to learn about in the last couple of years. Next slide. So I thought I would just note here for the audience at some high level, you know, point out some, the, there's this intersection of a number of really high level challenges that are making uh, people who rely on fish for food, people who might rely more on fish for food, uh, stressing people in multiple ways, double, triple exposure um, from resource grabbing, coastal grabbing, and also all of this new pressure and eyes on the waters of the world as um, the global narrative spins up around this thing that people are calling a blue economy. Um, climate change, of course, is impacting coastal communities um, already, has been for a long time, and is going to continue to do so, including through fisheries, as are other drivers of change. Um, at the same time, and we heard a little bit, of, uh, quite a bit about this in a, in a downscale experiential way, uh, Community food systems, individual households, food security is tremendously vulnerable in multiple ways uh, because in some ways, because of global food system vulnerability, uh, we see that uh, most um, notably in many re remote communities, uh, communities that are at the end of a very long, complicated food supply chain, I think is a fair way to put that. And there's a real issue of social and environmental justice in that when we have a food system that when it stutters or fails, um, hurt some people more than others. Um, whether you're a student, an indigenous student, whether you live in a northern community, coastal community, or so forth. We looked at that in my research group over the last, going on two years now, with respect to how um, small-scale fishing communities and seafood supply networks, seafood value networks, uh, were impacted by um, shutdowns and other public health measures associated with the pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about that, what we saw right now, because that really is, I think, the entry point to um, to where I'm going with this, which is the leverage points that I think something like philanthropy can really help um, in order to help communities build capacity around fish's food for food sovereignty. Next slide. So this is from one of the from the synthesis paper that we. Um, and when I say we, I mean my collaborators, Josh Stoll at University of Maine and other other number of other researchers and students and also multiple people from small scale fishing communities around North America were also co-authors on this paper. Um, and we, we've looked at what happens when you get a global level disruption, a systemic shock as we have it here, um, to something like a seafood supply chain. Uh, and you see um, whether it's the pandemic most recently or whether it was uh, recessions, um, you see noteworthy global level disruptions. But what happens is, you know, that it does people still get fish. And it turns out that more, more often than not, it's local and small scale and alternative fishers who pick up the slack and provide resilience to the global food system when global complicated food networks are impacted and disrupted. And so there's this real sort of unequal, unjust distribution of costs and benefits that the global food system, or in this case, the global seafood system, by and large does not serve, fully serve local small scale and remote communities in the way that it could um, really exists on the back of, of those communities. And then when it has problems, it's those local producers, harvesters, processors, distributors that pick up the slack. When we move from sort of a local fish being put into a global system uh, to local fish re being redirected in some cases um, to other local consumers and um, to people who need it. And in some cases that happens, in some cases it doesn't, as we heard um, you know, from the earlier talks, um, COVID has made it hard for people to get traditional foods in many communities, 
uh, other communities that I've worked with in Maine and in Coastal BC were finding ways to pivot really quickly and take advantage of opportunities and sort of gluts of fish and freezers uh, to redistribute that fish or through school food programs, find other ways to get it to people who need it. Um, and so there's a real, there's a real pattern of, of winners and losers. And <laughs> our research group really wants to try to figure out what it is that's helping people to respond to shocks, to make access to seafood during times of stress more equitable uh, and just. Um, and that was what the research was about. We, we spoke to people who experienced challenges. We spoke to people who experienced successes and we, we, we tried to figure out why. Next slide, please. Well, what we saw and we looked at both, we did what we called scraping of data from the internet. We looked at search analytics, Google analytics, and we also asked people to share um, for-profit, small scale for-profit firms to share their marketing um, and website traffic information. And, and what we saw when, when COVID hit was not surprising to us. Uh, we saw a tremendous upswing in interest in local and alternative seafood networks by people who no longer could get it at restaurants, by people who could no longer find fresh fish uh, in grocery stores. And, and that was both a good thing from a food security and continuity of people having access to high quality fish um, because these networks were able to pivot and provide that. But again, some people had more access to it than others, um, perhaps because of price, perhaps because of where the markets were. Um, and but in some cases, as I said, some fishermen, um, some fish processors and small scale fishing companies went out of their way to find ways to ensure that the fish was going to people, not just people who could afford it, but the people who needed it, the people for whom it's a culturally preferred and traditional food. Um, we also incidentally, the, most of this research focused on North America, Canada and the US, um, but we also spent time talking with some folks working in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we saw very similar pattern there, uh, people pivoting, people finding ways and to leverage existing networks to, to get food where it needed to be. Next slide. So I've said a couple of times the term alternative seafood networks. And what I mean by that is it's sort of a caricature. Uh, there's multiple different kinds of networks or communities of practice out there or, or, you know, groups of people working together to provide subsistence for their communities. And, and by alternative, really what, it's not the best word, uh, but what I mean by that is it deviates from sort of the large institutionalized international trade system uh, that works, that functions primarily by extracting seafood from places, putting it into international markets and then sending it back, uh, not to those same places, but to the places that can pay the most for it. Uh, alternative seafood networks, um, function differently but also generally are guided by a different set of values that 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 orient not just around bringing fish to people but also fishing sustainably in many cases also um, paying living wages paying good wages having a, a safe work environment and again um, ensuring um, some level of equity and access um, to to seafood now, so that's what i mean by that term uh, it's not the best term and and it's sort of calling Calling them alternative is sort of in a linguistic way may in an unintentionally privilege the international system. And I don't I don't mean it in that way. I, I, I mean, I feel like these things we're calling alternative food networks really are the things that are serving people the best and over over millennia have it's just it's how we've worked. Um, but there's still this they still exist today anyway in the sort of in the shadow of the dominant um, trade oriented food system. Next slide. So this might be, there you go, super, you made it larger. That's helpful for me and I'm sure the rest of the audience. Um, so here you see what we, we coded and organized the, the different factors that supported people's ability to be resilient and adapt and pivot and get people, you know, keep selling seafood. Um, the things that either supported or hindered if they lacked it like processing capacity and then and then the factors that that really got in the way and we organized these in sort of in three settings there were factors related to the individual fishers their values for example decisions they made or if they already had access or supplies of fish there were social factors related to demand related to sort of community structure 
related to existing relationships and networks. But what I'm going to focus on here, because I did really want to tailor this around a conversation of what what can we learn from how people responded to COVID that could inform philanthropy, that could inform a network of people who are looking to make good investments in communities that build food security and food sovereignty. And that's the what I call here the structural factors, the systems, the aspects of the system that are hard to change, that people really can don't have a lot of control over, that they often inherit uh, from the past or from decisions of the past. Um, and, that, and, and what were the things that were there, again, in the darker blue that helped? Uh, what were the things in green and light blue that, I, that in some cases got in the way? And I'll focus on some of these. And if you could advance the slide, it will actually just animate to the next to bring up some arrows. Perfect. Here are five examples that I see, and you're going to hit this hit advance one more time, I think, um, that I see as in, investment points or leverage points. These are places where fishermen and women networks or communities of practice of, of, of fishers have little to no ability to directly influence, but for whom the ability to respond to the pandemic and keep getting fish to the people who needed it, um, th these were the limiting factors or the or the things that really mattered. And so what that means for me is if people in communities of practice don't have control over these, but these are really the decision points or the drivers and determinants of what the outcomes are, this is where investment uh, can make a, a really big difference. And so I'll, I'll give you just a handful of these experiences. So, I mean, excuse me, of these examples. I'll start on the, bo on the bottom. Um, geographic access to markets. One of the biggest things that limited people's ability to get fish to people was not surprisingly getting fish to people because they last, lacked the infrastructure or they were physically too far away or they had no way to know who needed the fish that they were catching. Uh, and so they ended up selling it perhaps to people who wanted it, but didn't necessarily need it. So there's an opportunity there to make investments in connecting communities to fishers. Um, so that when, you know, to build resilience in that food system so people can continue to get fish. Uh, next, I'll, I'll move now up to an example that, that really uh, made it um, made a big difference, and that's access to, to, to money, access to financial capital, and whether that was loans, whether that was short-term federal assistance, the people who were able to tap into just a little bit of extra funding when disaster struck, when trade shut down, when markets closed, not surprisingly, they were able to adapt. They were able to try something new, maybe put up a website with an e-commerce system that connected people to and use social media to connect to the people that, that wanted to purchase and needed to needed to access to that fish. Um, another interesting example was one of the things so it seemed counterintuitive uh, when fisheries closed and international trade on fisheries closed is it turns out lots of people actually had too much fish in freezers um, and they couldn't move it because a lot of that fish was going to would normally have been going to restaurants. Uh, which is the was was before the pandemic the number one way that Canadians, um, people in, living in Canada, accessed seafood uh, outside of traditional food systems and subsistence. Um, the they had to they if they kept fishing they couldn't keep fishing if they had fish already in the freezers. So having access to to venues to use the food that was being stored allowed people working in small scale fisheries to keep fishing, allowed deck hands and other people working for fishers. And this has, was also, I should say, this is both East Coast, West Coast and Great Lakes. We also spoke with a number of, of commercial fishers on the Great Lakes of Canada, including um, um, folks working on the, the um, First Nations commercial fisheries on the lakes. Uh, they couldn't move their fish and they, so they couldn't keep fishing unless they were able to move their fish. And so, so the existence and the support to find ways and to connect with people who uh, would buy that. And all of that filtered through this next one in the middle there, processing capacity. If there wasn't enough place to store it, if there wasn't enough place to fillet it, to package it, to prepare it so it could be shipped safely to people who needed it, the fish just was just stuck. Uh, and there, were, there were examples of, of lobster rotting on trucks that were stuck at borders. There were ex examples of people deciding to throw away lower price point fish 
and seafood products in order to make room for the new catches so they could keep people fishing. It had there been more infrastructure that people had access to, more community oriented, perhaps collectively managed processing and storage capacity for fishing, um, there would have been much more opportunity to keep fishing and keep good again, keep those supply um, value networks going so that that um, that people who needed fish um, could have access to it. Next slide. So I have an example of what that looks like, what that capacity looks like. And we can just go ahead and I, I'm hoping the sound will work here. I've queued it up to just the, about a minute and a half in. This I'm going to tell you about it in a second here. We can't hear that. Um, and so maybe while you try to figure that out. Um, there might I be think it might that. not work for Lauren. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. So what I, it, you can just leave it right here for now, and, and what I'll, I'll explain what what the film is about. So, I right before the pan, pandemic hit, uh, I was working with a student and some and folks at Shawanaga First Nation, which is on uh, Georgian Bay in, in um, northern Ontario, um, to learn about a very small scale hatchery that they have on Georgian Bay, uh, that in which they've 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 built this hatchery around long standing traditional. Um, fish cultivation and, um, and um, practices. And uh, this clip right here shows a little bit of that. It shows uh, Aaron from Ajawang, who was the hatchery manager, um, talking about how it works. And, and I helped them produce this film uh, initially just for their community, to help their community better understand what this hatchery was, what they were doing with it, how it fit in to uh, educational experiences that they were creating for youth in the First Nation, uh, how uh, who was benefiting from these hatcheries and 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 so forth. And I wanted to share that as an example of infrastructure that only exists uh, because of social investment, in part because of First Nations investment. And you know, this is the kind of thing that a community can take traditional practices and implement them in a new way. Um, and having that infrastructure in place is capital to adapt when something goes wrong. And so you, you have the long-term benefit, they're experiencing the long-term benefits of this, as I said, through increased food security, through another mechanism for stewarding fish in their in their traditional homelands and in and, and those ecosystems, and also um, educational to help um, kids learn about the fish, uh, learn about their life cycle, uh, stay connected um, to um, the fish. The title is We Are Fishing People and it was a joy to help them pr provide some technicals and filming support to help them uh, produce this. Um, it's a really amazing hatchery that the at the end of this presentation there's a link um, my YouTube um, conservation of change channel that's where the um, the full the full about nine minute video is if you want to have a look at it but again it's just just one example I think of the kind of community pr project asset initiative that that can be that philanthropy can make possible that then empowers communities with the the resources and infrastructure that they need to be able to pivot when faced with some sort of surprise next slide so a couple of take-home messages for you uh, what we learned in the pandemic was that our food systems are, are most resilient when they're like the stone wall um, there are invariably large actors, large rocks that are out there that we rely on, that we all rely on when we go to the, um, the Loblaws or whatever the, the stores we've gone to. Um, but, but when things break down, what ends up invariably holding that stone wall together are the small communities that pivot, that turn to their neighbors and make sure everybody's fed um, and, and healthy and safe. Um, and that happens with diversity. Um, and so you know, the, the, the large stones in the wall don't need a lot of help. They're doing just fine. They can take the hit of a, of a crisis of a pandemic and they have done that and we've seen that, but philanthropy supporting indigenous local and alternative food networks, that th those important small stones in the rock wall uh, don't have the support, don't, you, know, don't, you know, and can get it through, um, through um, philanthropic giving. Uh, and, and the benefit there is that it supports not just a business model that matters to the broader food system, but it also allows people to continue to do things in a way 
uh, that's oriented around community and traditional values. Uh, and so all of that sort of leaning in if, if to the outcome is that if, if, if I, you know, if we are looking to support people in pursuing, obtaining, maintaining, and strengthening food sovereignty, um, this is this is a way fish sovereignty um, is one of the paths up that mountain. Uh, next slide. So that's that's it for me. I kept it a little short to uh, allow some conversation. Uh, you can find that film on my website there and on my YouTube channel if you want to um, reach out to me. That's my contact information. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. I'm just going to switch over to Kimberly's slide and let her go. Hello, everyone. Sorry, Kimberly. <laughs> no problem. I love going last because then uh, I don't have to say as much because everybody else has already said so many wonderful things. And um, it's uh, wonderful to be in a group of like minded individuals who are, are working towards uh, community, food sovereignty and accessibility and inclusivity. And uh, uh, thank you for the inv invitation today. So. Um, you know, we've all been talking about food and fish, and so I'm going to be talking about actually the activity of fishing and how it can be used to create transformative personal, personal and social change. Next. And just, I know it was mentioned that I was a classroom teacher, so this was my space. And um, there's no pictures of me teaching in the classroom because like, all right. <laughs> I was happy to stay in the classroom teaching about um, you know, electron configurations. I thought they were really cool, but uh, yeah, here we go. Next one. But um, I began to worry, and this was, of course, pre-COVID. This was back in 2006, and, you know, all of this building worry about the biggest problems, and um, they all center around the ocean, really, even how to feed 9 to 10 billion people. So, um, as a teacher, I really felt that besides ocean being at the center of climate change and biodiversity collapse, and um, I felt that youth were right there and education was important. And I thought about, of course, my own childhood. Next slide. And, you know, I was, of course, observing children and thinking about what they were faced with, this uh, disconnect with their grandparents and their ancestors and community and culture and some of the new theories that were coming out about nature deficit disorder and biophobia, fear of life. But yet the kids were falling in love with video screens and uh, smartphones and all kinds of computer games. And all of these things that they were connecting with on virtual screens was not giving them a sense of place because, you know, these video screens can be accessed from anywhere and they look like any place. And so they weren't connecting with their own um, communities and their own natural habitat outdoors. Next. And so when you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and then you add Wi-Fi to it, you're really in a lot of trouble. <laughs> think about when you see people go into a restaurant, sit down, sometimes first thing they do is pull out their phone and check and see if they have Wi-Fi. Um, you know, the increase in, in depression and, and social and mental issues that young people have now because of cell phones is on the rise. And I saw that as a classroom teacher. So um, at the very beginning, next. Uh, just about that time, my, my grandfather passed away. He's that really handsome guy over there on the left. Um, and he meant a lot to me. He used to tell me uh, stories about his childhood. And, and, um, and, and as family members, when they pass away, you have to go through their belongings. And the, the odd thing was that he, one of the things that he really spoke to me about was his time overseas in the Pacific during World War II. I mean, these weren't, these were stories that he really told me about, but yet he shared with me stories of um, going fishing with his uh, grandmother who was Cherokee and, you know, helping her plant, um, 
corn and sweet potato. And, and these were the stories he shared with me. He never said anything about World War II, but yet, you know, we go see all these big Hollywood blockbuster movies about World War II and we romanticize them. And so I had never seen this picture. Um, it was just stuffed up in the attic somewhere. Next picture. But yet in his Bible next to his bed was tucked this picture of me, my first fish and a letter that I had written to my grandfather when I was, oh gosh, nine years old. I'm doing the math now, looking at the, the letter I wrote him. In all those years, he kept this picture of me in my first pick, my first fish and tucked in his Bible. It's so, you know, this resonated with him. And that, that event resonated with me too. It, it meant a lot to me too. And so all of these things got me to thinking about what do I need to be doing with my life as a, you know, a person and, a, and a, a teacher who wanted to make a difference in the lives of children? Next slide. Um, as a teacher, the most meaningful moments that my students would have and that I would have was when we were outside. So, you know, even if I was teaching chemistry or physics or uh, I finally got to teach marine biology and I, I took my, my students outside. And so those were the most exciting moments when we got to interact out in nature. Next slide. So what I want you to think about and which so many of the people here uh, presenting with me today have already thought about is that we need to think about fishing in a different way. And what you're doing right now is you're looking through the lens of cod's eye. And you can see that it turns the community of Petty Harbor upside down and around. And that's what we really need to do about fishing. We need to stop thinking about it just as commercial fishing, recreational fishing, because there's so many other things in between. It's not just commercial and it's not just recreational. There's so many deep things that are happening in between those two very limited ways that we're using to um, explain or talk about fishing. And by just talking about them um, in those two ways, we're leaving out so many other deeper experiences of fishing that could be um, really meaningful for young people, for our elders, for our communities, for our food system, um, for our mental and physical health. So we, we need to change the language, we need to expand access to fishing, and we need to really recognize the importance to our well-being um, to, to do this. Next slide. So I quit teaching, as you can tell probably, or at least classroom teaching. And I went back to um, graduate school in um, fisheries and aquatic sciences, you know, did the master's PhD, but quit before I got my degree because I bought some property in Petty Harbor and wanted to, well, not wanted to, but I um, started a nonprofit to teach kids to fish. I actually was able to um, convince a small group of um, people to be board members along with me and they let me go at it. And so I wanted to teach every child in Newfoundland and Labrador, Odahomkuk, and this beautiful place that we occupy. I wanted to teach every child about their uh, traditional fishing knowledge and ways of their ancestors, whoever their ancestors might be, so that they would become uh, connected to this place, not to a virtual screen. And that would help them to protect and conserve their natural home. Um, so I set out to do that a lot of work. Next slide. And, um, you know, to, to think about all of that, because humans have, you know, fishing predates agriculture and, you know, it's fishing, gathering, hunting. And if you think about all of the cultures all around the world, uh, people have to live near water, whether it's a pond, ocean, stream, river. Or, so there's some kind of fishing going on. Um, families fishing together, um, communities fishing together, women with their children gleaning from the shore. There's um, all sorts of fishing going on. Um, Leo, um, our um, elder, I guess you could call him, he's uh, the guy in the lower bottom there. And and I, and I, I keep talking to him about how I, I want him to try some of these other methods and we all wanna join him with that because it's just wonderful to be able to share all of these different ways of fishing from around the world. And next slide. Most kids today, this is their experience with fish. Tilapia, I don't know, where's tilapia from? Well, I do know, but kids don't know because there's their experience with fish is that square thing on the bun that they get through a drive-through. 
local fresh fish is just not readily available and it's not served in our schools. And so that's a really big problem. And then when you compound that with the fact that young people just don't have access to actually going fishing and the activity of fishing, because there are so many barriers to getting out in nature and that is compounded by the intersectional issues that we have with getting people out in nature. Next slide. So what is fishing for success then? Well, um, probably introduced this way, we're a nonprofit social enterprise. We work to transmit the intangible cultural heritage of Newfoundland and Labrador's family fishery. We advocate for a sustainable and equitable small scale fishery that can be part of the puzzle in combating climate change and food insecurity. So we're a participatory museum. We're members of um, the Museum Association of Newfoundland and Labrador and the Canadian Museum Association. And we're also tourism operators because you know just as soon as you go to funding agencies and say you wanna take kids out on boats and then you wanna give them sharp knives so that they can fill it their own fish, um, like funders really don't like risk. And so it's uh, we haven't been able to get funding <laughs> except to take tourists out and we use their money to um, fund most of our programming. Fortunately, we have been able to get Canada summer jobs each year. We're very grateful for that. And the Canadian heritage um, has been able to help us through uh, some of the, the humps of COVID. Thank you very much. Next slide. Petty Harbor has a, a very unique heritage here in that um, the fishing families here have protected a hand line only fishery for cod. So hook and line is one of the most uh, sustainable ways to fish. And so that's very important to communicate to young people uh, in today's state of the ocean. And so there's a little map there and there's a booklet that you can find when you go to our website, fishingforsuccess.org and find out about that. It's also a great place because we're just 15 minutes outside of the um, capital of St. John's. So we have the greatest uh, number of tourists who we can welcome here, share heritage and, um, and hopefully get some revenue. And then of course, um, urbanized youth. And we have a wonderful um, network of nonprofit organizations that partner with us to um, create access for um, uh, marginalized groups to fishing. Next slide. So the important thing about fish and fishing is that it reminds us of our own place in nature. And this is what's really important if we're talking about um, fishing as being um, one of the pieces of the puzzle in combating climate change and feeding nine to 10 billion people in the future. And because uh, kids need to know where their food comes from and that this uh, fish was once a living being. And um, you know, the idea that, are we really gonna call it recreational fishing when we're talking about killing an animal. I'm not going to teach a child that it's a recreation when the animal has to be killed. So it's a food fishery and that's how we discuss it. Um, there's all kinds of issues wrapped up in that when you're talking about um, the words that we use. So it's not a recreation, it's a food fishery. We talk about quick humane slaughter of the animal and appreciating the animal and what it means to us. And um, we talk about humans own place in the food web and how we're all part of a food web and all part of nature and that that's where we belong. And the fact that humans haven't been interacting with nature um, properly is probably what got us here in the first place in this big old climate chaos problem. Um, so this is um, one of the things that we bring forward when we teach children about their place in the food web. Next slide. <clears throat> And what do commercial fishermen think about their fishery? And keep in mind, this is the way that they earn a living, they get money from it. And the biggest thing that they say about fishing is that it provides intergenerational connections for them and a cultural connection. Their biggest thing is not the money piece. And so rethinking how we talk about fishing is important even for those people who earn a living from it. Next slide. This is a uh, video that was created by our partners, Food First, Newfoundland and Labrador, who work to combat uh, food insecurity in uh, St. John's, which has the highest um, food insecurity of any metropolitan area in Canada. And are you able to get that going for me? 
Kimberly, I don't think that's going to work. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Leo is a fifth or sixth generation um, fisherman from Petty Harbor, and he's learned uh, fishing skills that's been handed down through the generations, uh, a patrilineal or through his fathers. And like many um, fishing families in Newfoundland and Labrador, when the Cod Moratorium happened in 1992, the, uh, many of the children moved away to places like Alberta and Ontario to get jobs because overnight 30% of um, uh, people in Newfoundland and Labrador were without jobs when the call, cod moratorium was called. And so here is Leo, our, um, our knowledge keeper of traditional ways of uh, fishing by hand line in Petty Harbor. He has this knowledge that um, he wants to pass down. He feels as, as if it's a gift from his father, from his father's father, and he has no one to pass it down to because his son is working in Alberta. And so he, he you know, really feels this need to share this knowledge and pass it down. So for him, um, being a board member and a volunteer with Fishing for Success, he is um, fulfilling that real deep need that he has to serve as a mentor to children like his father did for him. And so if you get an opportunity to go to our YouTube channel, um, please watch what Leo has to say about uh, starting a nonprofit to teach children to fish. Next slide. <clears throat> and this was um, a video that was created about our Girls Who Fish program. And this um, was created for women in fishery, um, no, women in seafood, which is an international program to represent the work of women. And it won a third place in 2018. And um, we started this program because when you get started um, teaching children to fish, you recognize that there's a gender issue, that um, girls and women, when they tend to go out fishing, uh, the guys tend to take over. And it's, um, it's just one of those social society things. And so we decided to start a Girls Who Fish program so that there would be mostly girls and women in the boat or on land. Well, it's Girls Who Fish and Leo. <laughs> because remember, we're trying to break that chain of patrilineal male knowledge. Um, and so Leo's helping to pass that knowledge down. But, you know, if um, we're, so Leo's passing that knowledge down to us, but um, if we, if we have too many men and boys there, they'll take over it. And girls, yeah, we tend to let them, you know, um, and if we, and if we let them, we'll never learn to do that ourselves. You know, the guys will start the campfire uh, they'll take the fish off the hook. They'll steer the boat. So we started a girls with fish program where the um, the girls and the women who who are learning to do that, and um, and that has encouraged women to look at fishing as um, as a career, whether it's as a a marine bi biologist or a researcher, as a commercial fish harvester, or or wherever they go with it. Next slide. We have many partners who work with us to provide access because the interesting thing that if, if you um, do get an opportunity to go and, and watch the video, what you'll notice is that many of the founding um, members of our Girls Who Fish program are um, young women, university aged women, and um, they have, um, they're, they're privileged and you know, they look like me, they're, they're, they're white. And um, is that the community that I want to build um, for the future? I want a fishing community to look like, you know, downtown St. John's. I want it to be diverse and inclusive and have, you know, all kinds of um, different people in it. And so how do you do that? How do you just invite people? So you have to target, uh, create targeted programming. So we have lots of nonprofit partners who we work with who help us do that. Next slide. So one of our um, partners is First Light. And so we work with First Light and we go fishing with them and we have a great time. And um, so we go ice fishing, we go cod fishing, we provide programming for their youth and programming for Inuit elders. 
and uh, we party together and learn together and we have a great time. So um, this is a way that helps both of us to share um, knowledge and um, build a community around inclusiveness and, um, and shared spaces. And, and making certain that, you know, uh, one of the things that um, was alluded to is that a blue economy and that blue economy is about space on the water too. So we need to make sure that that space on the water has space for all of us. Next slide. Another group that we work with is Association for New Canadians. And we have a project um, that our Girls Who Fish members volunteer with, for, which is called um, Women Sharing Heritage or WISH. And this was recognized by the um, CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, as a promising practice. And it helped the young women to um, adjust to Canada and they learned English faster and used less social supports and, and uh, they made friends and we made friends. And um, you'll notice that there's young children there. And that, so they bring their young children to the programming because nobody wants to leave their young children behind when they're in a new country. And so we all just have a great time with um, the young women from Girls Who Fish and, and young women of ANC. Next slide. So the program has expanded to Japan. Next slide. And this is a program that Girls Who Fish did with Choices for Youth to provide opportunity for their mama moments to learn about processing fish and think about social enterprises with the leftover pieces, parts that spoiled, <laughs> spoiled people who um, don't think that fish should have bones in them. Um, next slide. This is our youth cod fishery program where the youth start at the very beginning and learn lots of traditional skills. Next slide. So they maintain the boats and then they get in them. Talk about learning something that's really um, a, a really a beneficial activity. And then you get in the boat and how many young children today um, do something that their life depends on. Talk about bravery. This is about 10 feet. And this is um, someone who is an urban dwelling youth. And so they probably don't climb a tree anymore. And so this required a lot of bravery to climb down this stage head and move on to a, a floating platform that's moving, get into a boat that she just helped repair. And you can see the, the young man down in the boat is like hugging himself like this. And he wanted to know if it was safe. And I said, well, you have a PFD on and you did a good job repairing that boat. <laughs> and uh, so this is bravery. And we're asking our young people to be brave by being willing to start businesses, and put their foot out there and uh, risk their money and risk their talent. And so we, we need to start that from the very beginning. And that means physical bravery too. Next slide. So this is just some pictures of a, a young person catching his first fish. And uh, this program uh, provides opportunity for young people whose families are food bank dependent. So they get to bring home fresh caught fish. Next slide. We um, are developing a sea to school program where we bring um, cod's heads <laughs> to schools and the kids practice cutting out cod tongues, which, which was a tradition in Newfoundland and Labrador for young people to earn um, extra money during the summer. And then of course, a program where the young people come out on the boat. And then when they bring their fish back, they process it and uh, cook it up for a meal right there at our property. Next slide. This is a fish for Fridays program that we started um, during the uh, very beginning of COVID-19 when so many people were locked down and then they had a problem accessing food. So we worked with food banks and uh, local outreach programs to deliver um, prepared cooked meals. Next. <laughs> and we um, partner with lots of artists to bring fishing into um, music and artwork. Next slide. This is um, a paper that um, Pauling created. This is sort of a, and if you enlarge it for everybody, Oh, I this don't is, know if I can do that. Oh, it, it popped up larger right there. My, yeah. It just may have been slow for me. So this is um, this piece adapted from two of uh, Polly's papers. And so if you compare small scale fisheries to large scale, 
this is the advocacy piece that we like to point out to people about um, depending on small scale fisheries for your fish food. And you can see that um, looking at the annual catch for human consumption, that's right there in the, mil uh, the middle, it's you've got the same number of fish, five fish each. And so you're looking at, you've got higher employment, less gas used, you stay closer to shore, smaller boat. So it's more efficient, less fuel, um, less subsidies too. If you've been hearing about the issue um, about subsidies, uh, subsidizing large scale fishing being a problem, it definitely is. You look down at the bottom, you see that um, small scale fisheries have uh, less discarded uh, fish at sea or bycatch, which is that's living beings that are wasted and not eaten. We don't like that either. So this is a great illustration of why small scale fishing is much better for the environment, for me, for ethics, for all of us. Uh, next one. Small scale fishing emits less carbon. And so that's just pulled right off of that piece there. Next one. Again, that same piece about it, uh, it's more efficient at food production while maximizing employment. And, and the other thing that I like to point out as a person who lives in a small um, fishing community, uh, I like to see lots of little boats in the harbor. And as a person who's involved in a tourism operation, I know that visitors love to see little um, fishing boats in the harbor too. So it's also good for tourism. So there's a lot of win-wins here. Next slide. Talking about gear, this is a, a great um, ranking for gear. You look down at the very bottom at green and you see harpoon and diving is the greatest uh, least severe way to go get your fish, but the water in the North Atlantic is pretty cold. I wouldn't really recommend that. So hook and line is the next best way to do that. So that's what we do here in Petty Harbor for cod fishing. Next one. Kimberly, I'm so sorry. Do you mind um, pushing through the slides? Because we just yep. have a little bit of. Yep. I'm almost done anyway, aren't I? I only have a few yep. left. So go I'm to the next sure. one. Yep, now I'm almost to the end. So um, getting women involved is very important. So if you notice here that uh, the fewest number of women are involved up in the top here at leadership roles and fishing. Next slide. And why is it important to get women involved? Because women uh, tend to be more conservation minded and community minded. And just to think about what inspires you, I've told you about my personal story. This is a Twitter um, statement from Natalie Panic, who is a space engineer, and she puts the credit to fishing to getting her interested in science. Next one. So when you think about what might inspire these young people and, um, and new Canadians to become, because they've experienced uh, a transformative fishing experience. Next slide. And so this um, little girl over here on the left, she was um, coming with her mother, uh, a new Canadian with us, and she's telling the story about what she's gonna do with her fish that she just caught that day. And she's gonna use all these spices and she just caught her own. I just, I can still hear her telling me how she's gonna cook up her fish. And so I know that years down the road, she's going to remember this experience of going fishing and it's going to be it's going to mean something to her that one of the you know first moments of coming to Canada was going fishing and and having this meal and sharing it with her family you can just tell from her face what a positive thing it was here's a picture of um, one of our fishing sheds on the property and just from looking at this shed we've tried to to communicate to people that there needs to be space for everybody in the boat. That pride dory there is um, a painted wooden dory, which is one of the traditional fishing boats. And we wanted to communicate to people that there needs to be room for everybody in the boat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. 
Uh, we are very grateful for Ivan White, who is um, who works with us at Grenfell. He is a Mi'kmaq from the west coast of uh, this island. Um, he contributed these images and sounds to help us connect this panel discussion back to the place where the Atlantic Hub resides. Fundamentally, um, these conversations that we had today are very important to us in this part of the world because we want to build more um, stronger and connected food systems. Um, you know, the diversity of this panel is going to make it very hard to uh, tie together all of the important messages that we heard today. But I also, I do want to have some time to uh, hear from anyone who has questions out there. So I don't know if we have a few minutes to, to hear any questions or feedback. Jean-Marc and Peter, are there questions in the chat? Um, I don't see questions per se. There's uh, um, uh, no lack of, uh, there's all kinds of great links. And so links who were being po busy being posted as you were going along and making mentions to things. But um, I would like to ask a question of the panelists and that is, um, if you were, uh, let's put it this way, if you were caught in a ding, uh, in a dory uh, with a uh, with a with a foundation um, um, chief uh, executive or uh, the chair of their board, um, uh, what would you tell them and what would you ask for? Shall we just go around and ask if any, in the order that we did the speakers, if anyone has anything to respond, would that work? Starting with you, Marlene, perhaps? I think you're on mute. I can't, Still can't hear, hear you, Marlene. Marlene. Yeah. Oh, shoot. I'll answer that. Uh, okay. Okay. Hi. Um, I would, <clears throat> as I already did, I would ask for a greenhouse in this area. Uh, not only would uh, it um, help us in our in our dietary kitchen, but it would also educate, go a long way to educating people to learn to live off the land. Um, on top of that, I would ask, um, because I don't usually ask for just one thing, <laughs> I would ask for a boardwalk or a nature walkway to go from our hospital site to friends of, it's called Friends of Cedar Bay, where there's uh, stables, um, and also connecting to a lake at the back. The Ojibwe's have traditionally grown wild rice. Um, there's a perfect lake back there where you can grow wild rice. Not only would we use that wild rice in our Meacham kitchen, but our long-term care facility, our 76 bed uh, facility that we were promised uh, by the Liberal government about five years ago, that still haven't, uh, hasn't happened, <laughs> is supposed to be on this side. And that's where our elders, so if you take them back to the land, rather than just looking at the TV or four walls, if you can build programs that takes them back to the land and so they can observe all those traditional activities that they used to be involved in, plus teaching um, uh, students, children from the, from the local schools, as well as using that wild rice in our, uh, in our Meacham, in our Meacham kitchen to serve um, traditional foods to the clients. And not only that, but it uh, it will it would bring back nature, all the beaver, all the ducks and all the geese in the area. So it's it's got a connected, all these things will impact each other, the nature, conservation, teaching, education, um, providing food security, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Marlene, I wonder, can we hear you now? No. 
You can hear us. I'm not sure we can you speak, try to speak again. No, sorry. I'm not sure why. What's happening? Sam. Yeah. Can you add in the chat what you would ask for? Maybe would that work? To type in the chat. I don't know maybe. if we have access well, to a chat. Oh, maybe we don't. I think we so, do this a chat box, but I, yeah. Yeah, this is a chat so box. Maybe you can. You can go with the oh. with Philip to answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I my my first answer would be sort of a a general version of the first answer that we had in that when I, you know, I was talking about leverage points and funding for infrastructure uh, would be to say needs are very place based and community specific. And so if you want, you need to go and talk to people to know what it really is that will make the most difference in that particular case. Uh, and then I would say outside of that, the one thing that I, I feel like really holds from community to community is that everybody is so busy on their back feet doing the things they need to do to keep their community running and meet people's needs that that they rarely have any free space on their schedule to to share or to do something generative to share and learn from each other and so whatever you could do to fund an opportunity to get people together um, to learn from each other which which is hard because that means they're away from their desk that means they're not working on the whatever the current crisis is and that again so then figuring out that magic point of investment to to help free people up um to do that um funding travel funding stipe stipends and honoraria um helping organizations part fund new part-time positions so that you can free people up to to again to go and to go and share and talk to each other and, and see what the community over here is doing and learn from that and so forth um, those are the those are the things that i would say to the to the to the philanthropist in the dory. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what was Great. going on. I had a place. Um, I think if I was in the dory and I was talking to an executive, um, with, with what I do for a living, I teach cooking, culture, and cuisine, and I also, as an activist, I would ask them, what they have is for, for between a one to a five year plan on funding and helping smaller and uh, remote communities on their food supply and their food sources and most of all their food insecurity on uh, fish and beyond. And it's very important today to uh, make sure that the more northern communities we have are, we are, are in Lewis, especially my nation in northern British Columbia where it is very, very uh, becoming a shortage. And with the way the gas prices and everything is even more north than that, which when I've done uh, survey, I was just talking earlier on eggs, that they have to have a future plan. Where do we see each other in one year from now versus where do we see each other in five years from now on, on the food, food insecurity um, you know, plan? It is in a crisis. And it is, it, you know, we, we are fighting our own traditional old, old ways. And to be able to, to maintain to be traditional, we're fighting because we're fighting the elements constantly. And with, with the elements, what everybody is saying today, from the, the waters to uh, getting to, from uh, people in remote country, uh, areas of this whole country is, is in the dire um, I'm listening to the cod story because uh, it's one thing that I have in my plate off. And uh, what you're saying too, Phil, with the salmon, the wild fuck and salmon, everything, everything, everywhere, I watch it because it's, it's my life. And unfortunately, it's, you know, it's forced me to take my chef's jacket off and out to teach only because I am very short of uh, getting supplies in as uh, catering in Montreal here. Thank you. Thanks, Marnie. Kimberly, what, what would Hi. you ask for? So I would ask for transportation to get people to natural areas because you know we're right outside uh, St. John's and few people have um, transportation to get to natural areas, especially those people who um, it would be most meaningful for them. 
Um, and then the issue around access to fishing. It's, um, you know, we let's talk about what subsistence fishing means and what it looks like to provide that and expand it for people so that more people can um, participate in subsistence or food fisheries and expanding it to include other um, species of fish so that more people can fish for food um, and make certain that with this um, big looming blue economy um, that it's not just um, a way for um, big corporations to take over this natural space and um, block out families and communities who just want to um, participate in a natural space um, and continue cultural ways and, and have access to cultural foods. Because unfortunately, I've <clears throat> been in um, meetings where um, it's been asked that the recreational fishery um, end and um, because corporations want to be able to have that space on the water to themselves. And we can't allow that to happen because uh, right now the recreational ground fish fishery as the, as the food fishery for cod is called is the only way to transmit um, the intangible cultural heritage of the family fishery for cod here. And um, you know, so, yeah, so we, we need to talk about that. Um, also, we don't have a succession plan for a commercial fishery. I mean, we all aren't going to fish, and so we, we do want to be able to buy it. So what's a succession plan look like? Uh, we need to talk about uh, more and better ways to be able to access local commercial fish, whether it's from the wharf, whether it's uh, expanding fishmongers or even having fishmongers or having community supported fisheries. And, you know, all of these rules change as you move across um, the nation from province to province. They're different in every province. So I have a big list. I'll just leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Great question, Peter. Probably a good one to end with. Emily, do you think? I know where it's, there's so much yeah. we could talk about. We could probably spend the rest of the day together quite easily, but I appreciate everyone's mm -hmm. comments so much. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Emily. I appreciate this. I'm sorry for the, uh, oh, I guess the bad time management, uh, enough, enough time to hear cross between uh, the different panelists, because I am interested to know the connections that you see between each other's presentations. I hope that some of you may be okay if I follow up after uh, in writing up, you know, a summary of this conversation and just to hear back from you uh, any other insight that we don't have the time to get into today. And thank you much again for sharing your afternoon with us. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. It was fun. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Make good.